Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts for today, John DeLynn. It is April 14th, 2022, and I'm wearing my Be a Menace shirt in support of Black Menaces, the amazing uh, TikTok and Instagram channel of BYU students of color who are trying to, um, I don't know, fight racism. And we we love Black Menaces, and we're supporting them. So uh, shout out to them. We are really excited for today's episode. Uh, this is part three of our episode, of our, of, our, of, our, of our series on Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, with the one, the only, the myth, <laughs> the legend, Sandra Tanner. Hey, Sandra. How do you? <laughs> Welcome back. Yes. Good to have you. Yes. I now have you on my favorite list of directions. To go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> From uh, Google, Google Maps. Google or, Map, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I get in my car and I just hit find my favorite place. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're honored to have you in Mormon Stories Studios. So thanks oh, for joining good. us. Um, we're also joined by the amazing Gerardo Simano. Hey, Gerardo. Hey, John. What, what shirt are you wearing? Uh, Be a Menace. Black, <laughs> uh, Black Menace's TikTok channel. So excited. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have you again. And uh and of course, running the soundboard and doing the production that she does so well and commenting, we have Jen Camp. Hey Jen. Hi everyone. Yeah. So glad to have you. We're getting tons of feedback of people loving uh what you bring to the podcast. So Aww, we're, thank we're glad you. to have you. Thanks Appreciate for Appreciate that. Do. Yeah. All right. So uh again, I, I guess we have just a couple of super quick announcements, Jen. You want to do like 20 sure. seconds of announcements. Yeah, super fast. Um, so Open Arms Collective, um, women and non-binary um, group, we meet once a month. Um, you can see all the events on mormonstories.org slash events. Um, so we're doing cake decorating, um, yoga. We're having a speaker come in. Um, so go there, check those out, um, register there for those. And then um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the Lost and Found um, Club. They're having a Palentine's um, dance, drinks, um, just a fun party on Saturday. So go to lostandfound.club and you can sign up for that event there. Beautiful. All right. I think you broke the, the record for the fastest <laughs> announcements ever. Nice Good. Nice <laughs> I want to get right to Sandra, so I'm yeah, excited. Me too. <laughs> And we're super grateful for all the people who are joining us live on either Facebook or YouTube. We're grateful for our live audience. And we're going to be reading your comments throughout this episode and uh, showing them up on the screen. We, of course, always welcome anyone who wants to support Sandra. We are paying Sandra for these episodes. Um, you know, we also pay our staff. So anyone who values this content wants to throw us some super chat donations through YouTube. Uh, the little dollar sign in, in the chats, you can donate there or on Facebook, you can use the stars feature. We always appreciate that. And uh, of course, we're always grateful to our monthly supporters. Um, and we look forward to your comments. All right. Uh, without any further ado, let's get into it. So for those who didn't join us for parts one and two, we were inspired by a podcast with John, by the way, who else, Gerardo? Hank Smith and Kate Holbrook. Yeah, and, and they did sort of a internet Sunday school where they replicated what's often done in Mormon Sunday schools whenever Doctrine and Covenants 132 is covered. Uh, it's it's If it's covered, it's kind of really <laughs> breezed over. A few of the highlights are mentioned in apologetic ways that, that make polygamy look a lot more favorable than it probably should. And then a whole ton of the sections are skipped. So for parts one and part two, if you haven't watched them or listened to them yet, go back. Uh, we cover in those two two uh, episodes, DNC section 132 verses one through 40. But one of the most conspicuous parts of those Sunday schools, uh, virtual Sunday schools, is they left out verses 41 through 66, conveniently. And that's where the juice is. That's where the meat is. Right, Sandra? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what we thought we'd do is to hold post-Mormon Sunday school, where we are going to be reading DNC 132 like it should be read for those who really care about truth, 
who really care about history and who frankly care about women and care about the treatment of women, we're going to be having post-Mormon Sunday school. So Sandra, you've got your scriptures. You want to show us your scriptures? Yes, right. Got your scriptures in your lap. (laughs) Yes. And we're going to have... It's marked up and everything. (laughs) So Jen, you ready for post-Mormon Sunday school? I am. Gerardo, you ready? Super ready. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just thinking, John, should we just briefly in a few minutes talk about the things that we established uh if already on the first two episodes yeah if, there's, if, you, if you can summarize it yeah yeah so basically we established that there's no doubt that joseph smith practiced polygamy right we established that he definitely had sexual relations with at least some of the women we know like there's evidence for that and kate holbrook hank smith they talk about that And we should add, according to the Book of Mormon, that's the whole point, is to raise up a seed. Right. So if Joseph weren't having sex with his plural wives, he would be violating the Book of Mormon. Right, Right, Sandra? Yes. I mean, the one excuse for having polygamy was to raise up seed, and yet they want to keep saying he didn't sleep with any of them. So I don't understand why he's marrying them. (laughs) Right. And we've already talked about the fact that many of these plural wives, after Joseph died, signed sworn affidavits that they were married to him in very deed correct yes yeah okay what else Rodo? um we established that he violated some of the things revealed on doctor and covenants 132 like right? the law of sarah he's supposed to have asked emma for permission for all subsequent wives and he was married 22 times at least before he ever talked to emma about this revelation not to mention the fact that he started polygamy before even this, the gift of sealing with Fanny Alger. He started polygamy before he was even given the power of sealing. Yeah. Kate, is, Kate Holbrook does a really good job at telling us the, the, the best date that we know for Fanny Alger, which is 1833, right? I think the church and usually Brian Hales tries to put it as close as possible to the reception of the uh when the when joseph receives yes. the yeah, power this, of the ceiling yeah some of them want to move it up to 36 right and that's kind of late right so kay holbrook uh who works for the church she's a historian she tells us it's 1833 um so that kind of doesn't make sense joseph marrying women um before receiving the power of the ceiling um we established that he married women who were already married to faithful man in the church we right? call that polyandry for those who don't know yep. yep some of them were even on during on missions when joseph married their uh their wives right yep, yep. what else sandra do you remember <laughs> <laughs> i don't i can't remember what all i'd have to go read my scriptures i think mean, that was the most some of the most important highlights yeah, yeah no i think that's all that's all really important stuff. And yeah, we'll, we'll be getting, there's some repetition. I, I, there's some repetition, but I think that covers it. Yep. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, um, so, so pull out your scriptures, everybody pull out your real scriptures or your virtual scriptures. We're going to start with DNC 132, uh, verse 42. And we're going to just read 42, not 41. 41. Sorry. Thank you. And we're going to just read uh, verse by verse and have commentary on it. Is that okay? okay? And I'll, I'll read and then you guys comment. And then I'll, if I have a comment to throw in, I will. So uh, DNC 132 verse 41. And as ye have asked concerning adultery, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man receiveth a wife in the new and everlasting covenant, and if she be with another man, and I have not appointed unto her by the holy anointing, she hath committed adultery and shall be destroyed. All right. What do we, Sandra, what's interesting about that verse to you? Well, uh, the, the word destroyed is problematic because are we seriously saying, is God seriously saying she'll be killed? I <laughs> have Mormons try to, <clears throat> say to me, oh, that doesn't mean that. It means spiritually. She would be spiritually destroyed. And I said, well, I don't know that that makes me feel a lot better. Uh, <laughs> she's going to hell forever. Um, 
but I think all the way through the the feeling you get is they're talking about physical harm some way in destroyed. <clears throat> and when I think in terms of the temple ritual, um, which they would have been through at this point, weren't they doing blood oaths in there where they were drawing their thumb across their throat, uh, swearing an oath that if they revealed these things, they'd be destroyed? How did Mormons understand destroyed? Would it have been the same as in the temple as what's said here to Emma? Uh, but it certainly sounds like God's going to kill her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's disturbing. This this destroyed word appears all throughout this section, and it just it's a God I I don't want any part of. <laughs> and it's supposed to be Jesus, right? Right? Isn't yes. isn't the God of the Doctrine and Covenants Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace? And he's yes. been, yeah. And well, one of the things that troubles me about this is there is in the Doctrine and Covenants at the time he's having this discussion or getting this revelation, supposedly in 43, or is it 42, whatever. Uh, when he gets section 132, there is already a section in the Doctrine and Covenants that says they don't believe in polygamy. So then to go to Emma, when the rule of the church has been voted on in the Doctrine and Covenants that they don't believe polygamy, and then to throw at her this kind of a threat, would publicly the church stand was, there was no polygamy. That's, that's a horrible thing to have be teaching that kind of stuff. And yet turn around in the bedroom and threaten Emma that if you don't concede to this, God's going to destroy you. I just, it's just a horrible thought. Yeah, because this stuff, Joseph's lying to Emma, but he's also lying to the church and, and the DNC, the equivalent of the DNC <laughs> and the Book of Mormon are both generally condemning it. Yeah. So it's all just, it's just really weird. It puts Emma in this weird situation. Right. Yeah. It's just weird to me too that God would be um, condemning <sighs> Joseph for, for not practicing the polygamy but not condemning him for lying to his wife yeah like he has a he has an angel with a flaming sword come down to tell him about polygamy but not any reprimand about lying to his wife at the same time and to the church membership and to yeah. the general public yeah, <laughs> yeah that just yeah. convenient okay um i i'm curious it's talking about if she, you know it's talking about some fictitious woman here if she be with another man and you know god has not appointed it then she hath committed adultery and will be destroyed it's not talking about the man that she would have had to have been with so why is it that god's destroying the woman for committing adultery and not the man that she's committing adultery with it doesn't even mention the man yeah. it's kind of like i mean in the new testament when when people are bringing the adulteress in front of Jesus, they're all wanting to stone her. And the guy that she would have committed adultery with is not even in the equation. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's almost, we're going to get into this theme, but it's almost just this idea that women aren't even important enough. I mean, women are the ones that are in trouble and men have this higher status where, yes. yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. It's, it sadly yeah. looks that way. Yeah. It's always bothered me that story that like where the man is right. as a woman, it's always bothered me. I actually um, did a talk in Sacrament on that one time because I, it, that story always bothered me. So I went and looked up cause he calls the woman, he calls her woman. And um, I've always heard that as a derogatory thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he also, Jesus also calls, calls his mother woman. Um, and yeah. so to him, it was an endearment. I don't know. Yeah. There's just a lot. There's a lot that is wrapped up in that whole story. I mean, yeah. it's a bummer that that these scriptures reflect misogyny so blatantly. Because you would think that if it's Jesus revealing his words to Joseph, Jesus would be more equitable and compassionate how, about how he talks about men versus women. But again, just like the Book of Mormon seems to really reflect early 19th century American rural mindset, 
So. The Doctrine and Covenants seems to sort of um, r- represent early 19th century misogyny yeah. and discrimination against women. Yeah. No? Well, it's been that way for centuries in England before they even came to America, where uh, the chambermaid uh, gets put upon by the yeah. manor uh, owner of the manor, and uh, she's the one that gets put out on the street, and he just goes on with life. Unfortunately, that's been part of the our history for centuries. Yeah. I think also when you consider the context, I mean, I know we talked about it in the last two episodes, but... It's important to always remember the context in which this revelation is being dictated. You know, um, Emma had already been mad about polygamy. She she refused to accept it. accept mm-hmm. it, yeah. and and then so Hiram tells Joseph. Joseph, Joseph was afraid to right. to tell Emma directly. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So Hiram tells Joseph, "Hey, if you come up with a revelation, or if you re- receive a revelation from God, then I can take it to Emma, and Emma might be." able to accept it now and joseph said well if you think that you probably don't know emma but he still dictates the revelation and then Hiram goes and takes it to emma so this is a revelation that was or dictated uh to convince emma you know to yeah. that polygamy was uh yeah. the real deal right yeah yes after joseph had 22 <laughs> plural wives i was a little late <laughs> And I, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I don't think we've mentioned this. It's got this language of a man receiveth a wife. So it's like a wife is given. So like, does the word, re- am I making too much of this? Does the word receive imply property in ownership? Well, that's how he talks about Solomon and, and David receiving their wives and concubines. And that when when they got, they took something that they had not received then they committed adultery, you know, on the verses that we read earlier. Yeah. Um, so to me, it definitely implies property. Yeah. But again, we're going back to uh, English culture. Right. Our wedding vows, uh, who giveth this uh, woman to this man? Yeah. You know, it's it's the same kind of feel. Yeah. yeah. Same in the temple. Same yeah. in the temple also. The temple, when you go through... Um, the the husband the receives mm-hmm. the wife yeah, through the veil. Through the veil. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anything else on on verse forty one? One verse <laughs> eight. Take us a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Move. Okay. Uh, verse forty two. If she be not in the new and everlasting covenant, and she be with another man, she has committed adultery. Is that repetitive, or is there something else interesting about that? I think it's repet- repetitive, but. It's the point that I was thinking about as I oh, was yeah. reading this, where yeah. like, so he's saying, if the woman has entered in the everlasting covenant, which means, you know, polygamy, she's been married to Joseph, but then she's with another man, then she has committed adultery. We know that Joseph, at least a third of his wives that we know of, were married to other faithful men, but Joseph never sealed those women to their actual husbands, you know, to the original husband, but he, he got sealed to, you know, to them. Mm-hmm. So the women were sealed to Joseph, but at the same time sleeping or being with their original husbands. So is he, I don't know. It, this seems like it's saying that the women were committing adultery with their original husbands. <laughs> and we do have that situation with, uh, is it, Patty session or Sylvia session? So Sylvia. Sylvia, mm-hmm. where uh, she's got a uh, living husband and gets sealed to Joseph. And then there's the question of uh, did Joseph actually sleep with her? Uh, and was she separated from her husband for a period of time <laughs> so that she didn't sleep with both men within the same week? I mean, the, I think Hales wants to make a position that she was uh, separated from her husband during the period that she was having relations with Joseph. But we know from Sylvia's statement that she believed that her daughter was Joseph's child, and yet DNA has shown she's really the husband's child, which would say she slept with both men within a very short period of time. Otherwise, you wouldn't get confused 
about who the husband was. So you wonder where that puts her in this verse. <laughs> Uh, did she commit adultery or not because she slept with her own husband? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very complicated. We have an important uh, message from, from uh, Jeremy body. He says, can you tell Sandra Tanner? I love her, please. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My fan club has started. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So on to verse uh, 33, 40, 43. And if her husband be with another woman, and he was under a vow, he hath broken his vow and hath committed adultery. But doesn't get destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good point. Mm. Yeah. And again, how does that work with polyandry, right? Yeah. Yes, it gets very confusing. <laughs> yeah. And family Oliver, you know, because we, most of the evidence we have it was that Fanny was, uh, um, uh, an, an, an affair. affair. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's go to 44. And if she hath not committed adultery, but is innocent and hath not broken her vow and she knoweth it. And I reveal it unto you, my servant, Joseph, then shall you have power by the power of my holy priesthood to take her and give her unto him that hath not committed adultery, but hath been faithful, for he shall be made ruler over many. Sandra, can you tell us what this verse is saying? Verse 44. Well, uh, they're going to package her up like a Christmas gift, evidently, <laughs> and give her to this guy. Uh, so if a woman does what? If a woman... Oh, if she's faithful to keep all her vows. Okay. She's got to be obedient. Okay. And uh, then he can give her to this other guy that uh, hasn't committed adultery, but has been faithful. And this uh, sets up Joseph as what, Sandra? Was the arbitrator of who gets to have a plural wife. He gets to decide whether both parties have been faithful, evidently. And there's no mention of like the woman getting to pick who she wants to be married to. Right, Jen? Right. Yeah. He just gets to assign her. <laughs> Like some stockyard animal to whoever he whoever he needs a favor from is what it sounds like. But then you're not usually the spicy. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is like this polygamy is what was the shelf breaker for yeah. me. I'm. You're allowed to be spicy. I'm a little bit, <laughs> a little bit passionate about no, this one. <laughs> well, I think it's also interesting at the end of the verse where it says. Uh, if he's been faithful for he shall be made, he shall be made ruler over many. So he gets to be a ruler over many women. Yeah. Yeah. And couples and families. <laughs> yes. Like, like, and for those yeah. who think we're just kind of nitpicking here, this is how it worked. Like both with Joseph and with Brigham, women were assigned yeah. to men and deals were made between, you know, parents of women yes. and the prophet and, and the prophet would, and parents would give their daughters to men that the prophets approved of. I mean, that's literally yeah. how it worked. And Warren Jeffs, this not, didn't just happen with Warren Jeffs, although it did mm -hmm. happen with Warren Jeffs. It happened with Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. Yeah. Correct, Sandra? Right. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. And that was in that was in the temple words until very recently. Yeah. They only very recently said mm. you used to have to like the woman yep. had to answer to the, her husband, and then her husband would answer to God. Yeah, the hearkening. Right. Yeah, hearken. Yeah. And just barely, just recently, they they changed the wording. I didn't know. I learned. I mean, I probably learned this earlier, but I had forgotten that originally on the temple ceremony, the women did not uh vow like they don't covenant with god, god. Yeah. it was directly to the husband yeah the yeah. husband and in, in the mormon temple mm -hmm. ceremony for the overwhelming preponderance of the existence of the mormon temple ceremony the man covenants with god oh. and the and the woman covenants to hearken to her husband as he hearkens then they later added the the phrase as he hearkens unto god right mm -hmm. so that was like a later addition mm -hmm. But but for like the original one was yeah. just harking onto the husband, yeah. no matter what the husband yeah. 
affect us. And again, I would just hope I would have thought Jesus would have been ahead of us on this. Not. Yeah. Yeah. Mormon Jesus. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So that's 40. And, and again, I just think, and we're going to, this is, this theme's going to come over and over again. It's so much power to give to a human being that he's deciding what women marry, what men. And he's taking women away from unworthy men and reassigning the women to other men. And, and uh, taking children to himself who just yeah. want to go to the dance. Yeah. And it's sad. Yeah. Yeah. And these are choices that by their belief system affect them forever. Right. When, when they, you take somebody and say, I'm going to assign you over here. Yeah. This is a forever deal in their thinking. Uh, so it just makes it such a monumental decision that seems to be putting all this power in one guy to be able to say whether you're going to be with your legal husband forever, or you got to be with the prophet forever, which would also mean your children you had with the legal marriage would go with the polygamous marriage. So you're not just, yeah. uh, changing husbands you're taking your kids with you to be in his kingdom right yeah <laughs> yeah it's messed up okay verse 45 for i have conferred upon you and i'm assuming you as joseph smith right mm -hmm. for i've conferred upon you the keys and power of the priesthood wherein i restore all things and make known unto you all things in due time so here it's conflating Joseph's keys and priesthood power with, with the ability to do all these, all this wife reassigning and children reassigning. Yep. And that's why you have in uh, some of the polygamous groups, they do reassign women. The leader gets upset with someone in the group and they just arbitrarily uh, take the wife and kids and assign them to somebody else. And the man is just left with nothing. But Following, that's well, yeah. this is where it comes from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, anything else on 45? All right. Um, 46. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that whosoever you seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth in my name and by my word, saith the Lord, it shall be eternally bound um, in the heavens. And whosoever sins... Whosoever sins you remit on earth shall be remitted eternally in the heavens. And whosoever sins you retain on earth shall be retained in heaven. Sandra, what's what's Joseph Smith doing here? <laughs> well, it looks like God gave him all the same power of judgment. And uh, I mean, that the president of the church has the ability to truly act as God to these people. He makes eternal decisions for people. Yeah, it's it's almost like Joseph is forgiving people's sins. He's remitting their sins, mm -hmm. and that has eternal consequences. And what I wrote is that that's just a lot of power. Yeah. Because we we often talk about the, well, you made the really cool quote, Gerardo, about how treasure digging is a metaphor for uh, the, the covenant, covenant path or the plan of salvation, because you're always searching for the treasure of like feeling good about yourself or feeling worth or value. Yeah. And it's always elusive because the church wants you on that hamster wheel of hustling for, for value and for worth. And in this case, so, and that's the way the law of chastity so often works and the temple recommend process because you want members feeling unworthy because otherwise they don't need the church. But if they do feel unworthy, then they need the church and the church can make them always feeling like they're hustling for worth. So giving Joseph the power to remit sins keeps the members really tied to Joseph and feeling like they've got to do good by Joseph and then he'll forgive their sins and then they can feel good about themselves. Does that, is that a stretch? No. And I think that also explains a lot why the Mormons keep building more temples because if you can keep the members worried about their acceptance before God, that they have to stay worthy to go to the temple, then it's a way of emotionally tying them to the church 
renewing the tie all the time every time they go. Yeah. That I never noticed that part that that he is actually saying that he has the same power as Jesus as, as Jesus. Yeah. I, like that like I was never taught that. Yeah. I was taught that Jesus is the only one that can forgive my sins. And now Joseph in here is saying that he has that power. He has that power to remit them, which I clicked on it on LDS.org just to make sure <laughs> that remit meant that is what they're saying. And it does. And I have never heard that ever. Yeah. And that's disturbing to me. Well, well, I, I, two, two things. One is like, what happens when the prophet messes up? We know, you know, Kate Holbrook wants to say, well, Joseph didn't do this very well. He didn't follow Doctrine and Covenants 132. He made mistakes. It was messy, <laughs> she says. <laughs> right. So what does this mean for like something so important, like forgiving sins, taking other women, other men's wives, giving them to others? What does it mean, you know? There's this idea that prophets cannot lead the church astray, but Jim Bennett, who you know is a faithful member of the church, he makes a really good point. He says that if if that's true, then that would mean that the prophet loses any kind of um, agency as soon as they're called as prophets, and that that can't be. So that so Jim Bennett believes that. The prophet not being able to make mistakes is a um, an apostate idea, uh, but it, it, you know. So if Joseph was making mistakes, why would God give him this much power? You know, how do we know how many of these people or like deals that he was doing were right, which ones were not? You know. And Sandra, as a Christian, I'm just curious how you feel about a verse that's claiming that Jesus is giving Joseph Smith the power to forgive sins. How does that make you feel as a Christian? <laughs> well, I guess devaluing Christ. Uh, I mean, the whole point of the atonement is he took care of our sins because none of us could do it ourselves. So why would he turn around and give that power to a fallen man? Uh, then we wouldn't have needed Jesus to die in the first place. If fallen men could take care of forgiving sins. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, this has second anointing vibes. This That's idea, what I was just going to well, say, what, too. What were you thinking? Go ahead. No, when Gerardo was talking, I'm like, then that takes into place the prophet and the second anointing. If he is going, if he also can sin or mm. not sin, you know, if he has that power. It's just so, it's, yeah, so messy. If everybody <laughs> is afraid that they're going to go to hell, if everybody, and that's, that's the basis of some people's interpretation of Christianity, that if they don't do the right things, they're going to hell. In Mormonism, they up it a little bit and they say, you won't be with your family or with God if you don't do what's right. Then the ability to make people think they've been forgiven of their sins is a lot of power. Yeah. And so this idea of, of Joseph being able to forgive people's sins, not only is it insulting to Christ's divinity, but it's giving him a lot of power. Yeah. If, if they do what he wants, like with the second anointing, if you pay enough money to the church, if you have enough influence, if you've donated enough money, if you've, you know, obeyed the brethren in a way that, that they want, then the church or the prophet will turn around and tell you your sins are forgiven. And then you can feel really good about the rest of your life because you're going to be going to the celestial kingdom. And that it, it feels like a form of patronage, like the Catholic church and indulgences. Yeah. Right. 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 Because you're, you are just like uh, indulgences because once you do everything they've asked of you for a long enough period of time, they're going to give you a guarantee that you have eternal life, worlds without end, wives without end, <laughs> everything. And you, hey, we got a bonus. You can commit any sin as long as you don't murder someone. Yeah. Don't take innocent blood. I mean, that's a lot of power to give to someone that they get to judge you on whether you're worthy for that. Yeah. And the, the second point I just wanted to make about this verse, this verse debunks the idea that, Bri that Brian Hicks came up with. 
that is very prevalent among the church, the members who know anything about polygamy, this idea that Joseph was doing some ceilings only for time and then some ceilings for time and eternity. This uh, verse makes it very clear that whatever Joseph was doing on earth was also being done on heaven. So Brian Hill's trying to say, well, somewhere just for eternity, he was not looking to have sex with them. Well, it was both. Like he was doing time and eternity and it, it was just, you know, all together. It came all in a package. Yeah. 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 That Brian Hills just so often feels like just uh, sort of like motivated reasoning, just using logic after the fact to try and justify. Because where's the scriptural basis for like certain ceilings, earth only versus other ceilings being eternal in heaven? Right. Where in DNC 132 does it <laughs> allow for that? Yep. Yeah. It's just like he's trying to excuse bad behavior. Um, okay. And we would think that we're beating a dead horse here by reading verse 47. But for me, verse 47 just takes it to another level. Verse 47. And again, verily I say unto you, whomsoever you, meaning Joseph, so this is Jesus talking to Joseph, whomsoever you bless, I will bless. And whomsoever you curse, I will curse, saith the Lord, for I, the Lord, am thy God. Is there any is there anything that's disturbing to you you all about that? Well, he's God's representative, and Jesus is going to give him the same power. To curse. Yeah, to curse. So, like, it's basically saying Joseph is God, right? Joseph is God, and if Joseph curses you, it's it's as if God It's a done deal. You. Yep, he has the power. So, I mean, it's it's God on earth. It's, it, this is, I mean, Joseph didn't claim to be God or Jesus, but he may as well. Yeah, he may as well have been pretty close. <laughs> I mean, you have all of you have the power to forgive, which is the power of the atonement, and you have the power to curse. Yeah, and and it's equivalent to God's and Jesus's power. Yeah. So, right. what else is there? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> kind of crazy. Yeah, when you think that you know, members wants to say that. Oh well, Joseph made mistakes, but it's it's all fine. Yeah. <laughs> We're only human. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. If we're only human, yeah. do we really want someone to have this kind of power? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, That's my point. Yeah, this is a massive power grab, and it's really disturbing. Jen, do you want to add anything to that? No, I'm just letting it sink all in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, verse 48. And again, verily I say unto you, my servant Joseph, that whatsoever you give on earth... And to whomsoever you give anyone on earth, anyone on earth, by my word and according to my law, it shall be visited with blessings and not cursings. And with my power, saith the Lord, and shall be without condemnation on earth and in heaven. I don't know if this is just repetitive. Yeah. But Sandra, what do you I am not quite sure what all he's getting at there. <laughs> yeah, is it repetitive or did he say something? You know. <laughs> <laughs> It's a chiasmus. Yes, it must be. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mystery. <laughs> it's just more power. I mean, it's just God's just really going to make sure he gets the point. Look, guy, I'm really <laughs> giving you all the power here. <laughs> Everything. No matter what way you want to define this, you got it. Without condemnation, on earth and in heaven, yeah. Alpha and Omega, from the beginning <laughs> to the end, forever and ever, amen and amen. Hmm. <laughs> 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 Um, and, and we didn't even mention that this revelation wasn't even put in the Doctrine and Covenants until, what, 1870s? Hey, 1876. Are, yeah, so yeah. it's like so many words and so much power to like not even be in the DNC for the first 30 years of its existence. Yeah. Right? It's weird. Yeah. Okay, we're beating a dead horse, but we're just reading the scriptures, guys and gals. <laughs> Come on. Um, all right. Um, uh, verse 49, right? For I am the Lord thy God, and will be with thee even unto the end of the world, and through all eternity. For verily I seal upon you your exaltation, and prepare a throne for you in the kingdom of my Father, with Abraham your father. So what's that? What's that about? Well, kingship. Exactly. Uh, Joseph uh, is going to be a king 
sitting next to God, Jesus, and Abraham, right? So, yes, he's one of those that will go on to become gods, as it said earlier in the Doctrine and Covenants about if you do all these things, then shall you, ye be gods. And this is, again, affirming that that's the goal. If you obey everything, you will not only have women without number, you'll have worlds without number, you'll have children without number for all eternity. And uh, this is for sure sealed now on Joseph's head. As long as he doesn't commit murder, everything is given to him to be a king over his own world. I mean, it's kind of, it's almost comical and sort of you could say it's out of the narcissistic playbook because you could you could argue that this entire section is being created because Joseph's in trouble. Because mm -hmm. Joseph is like messed up. He's he's married 22 women. He committed adultery with Fanny Alger. Now he's married 22 women without Emma's knowledge or permission. He's lied about it. He's hit it. And now he's granting himself powers, worlds without end, and thrones next to Jesus. Like that's and destroying her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you destroying know? all the yeah. women that disobey him. And uh, <laughs> destroying all the women. I mean, that's a really interesting way to sort of say, I'm sorry, I'm I kind of goofed up here. You know. Oh my gosh. That's why I'm always like, bless her heart. Like, I don't know. Yeah, because it's not this humble, I'm sorry. It's like, I'm more powerful than you ever would have imagined, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's at, not too long after this that he has himself ordained as a king. King king of the earth, a king of the world. Uh, the kingdom uh, the of God of, on earth or in whatever. the Council of 50, right? Yeah, the Council right. of 50 stuff. So the, he really is ramping up the narcissistic element um, of his own view of himself. I don't know how you get it much higher than than what he lays out here. Yeah, yeah. But the Mormons wanna to say today, oh no, we don't say that you get your own planet. We aren't saying you get to be a God. Well, everyone before, uh, what, 1960, all knew that they were gonna to get to be gods and have planets. Yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. tone it down now. We're gonna add something, Jen? Yeah. Okay. All right. So he's going to be on the throne next to God, Jesus, and Abraham. That's verse 49. As a king. King. Okay. Um, 50. Behold, I have seen your sacrifices. So he's talking to Joseph now. Joseph's kind of the, he's the martyr. <laughs> he's the martyr here. Joseph has been making sacrifices. Yep. So behold, I've seen your sacrifices and we'll we'll forgive all your sins. I think that's an interesting combination. <laughs> uh, okay, if he's doing sacrifices, it would imply he's doing <clears throat> everything to please God, and then he'll forgive him his sins. You know, it's like, well, how much do each of these factor in? How many sins and how much obedience? It's a little 22. confusing. Yeah, something I, I'm thinking because this word sacrifices, I mean, that's definitely I don't think is what's talking about here, but it, it just reminded me of this um, argument that Kate Hallberg was making and, and Hank Smith that Joseph, it was so hard for him to take all these women oh, and yes. that the angel had to come, you know, because he was so reluctant to practice it. <laughs> But then the language in Doctrine and Covenants 132 makes it sound like, oh, Joseph, if you want women, you can have them. That's the language on, okay, he's like, Wh whatever you, sh you shall take, I'll like on earth, whatever women you want to take, I'll and it'll bless add it. to your glory, right? right. It, it's all like a, a glory thing. So it's like a very different language. Like God is not commanding Joseph to take women. God is saying, you, you know, like he's you, not, he's giving permission. You can, right. Exactly. If you want it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't, it's, he, yeah. He just, yeah. That, yeah the revelation rhetoric. doesn't come across as a threat to right. Joseph exactly. that you have to live this or be destroyed. Yeah. yeah. And yet that's the way he paints it to these women that, right. Oh, God's going to destroy me if I don't go into this. Yeah. Yeah. But shouldn't, shouldn't it be forbidden to, Claim as a prophet that Jesus is telling you your sins are forgiven. Like that's a lot of power. You know, <laughs> yes. how, like in the United States, the executive, the commander in chief, you know, he's he commands the military, but Congress, you know, gets to gets 
you know, to raise the money for the military. Like you don't want all the power in one person. Right. And here we've got God, we've got the prophet saying that Jesus is saying to the prophet, all your sins are forgiven you. Isn't that kind of too like a conflict of interest a little bit in <laughs> <Yeah>. Revelation? <laughs> yes. And it's after the verses that already told him that he can forgive himself. Yeah. Because he's yeah. the same as Jesus. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't think it, it is. It's for those who are, let's see, th there's two options here. Either, uh, you know, wait a minute. We just, Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so either we, you kind of have two options, either God and Jesus just decided 22 wives in that this revelation needed to be given. And this is literally Jesus telling Joseph all the things that Jesus cares most about, or this is Joseph trying to justify something bad that he did to Emma and to force her to get in line, which is, you know, th throughout this whole DNC 132, those are kind of your two options. And when, when the prophet is saying that Jesus is saying that the prophet needs to be forgiven for all his sins, it, to me, that's kind of a red flag. Yeah. Like w which is more likely <laughs> that Jesus just happens to be forgiving the prophet for all his sins or the prophet is just saying, hey, I'm, I'm forgiven for all my bad things, and now you got to step in line. What do you think? I'm yep. just getting so angry. <laughs> There's yeah. like a fi fire burning in me today. <laughs> like I just get more angry and more angry as I read yeah. as we read these. Yeah. yeah, we should power through this because we 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 have we haven't even gotten to the good stuff to yet. Go. Okay, all right. Sorry, <laughs> I do think that these are all. I, I do think we're making important <laughs> points. All right. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so God has seen. So Jesus has seen his sacrifices. I've seen your sacrifices in obedience to that which I have told you. Go therefore, and I make a way for your escape, as I accepted the offering of Abraham, of his son Isaac. What? What? Well, that's again misusing that whole story because with Abraham and Isaac, the way of escape meant that Isaac didn't have to go through with it. Right. But in Joseph's case, he gets to go through with it. He's going to go ahead and take all the wives. It's not like, oh, God told me I had to take the wives. So I took one. God says, okay, that's enough. You proved yourself obedient. Uh, his obedience lets him take all he wants. Yeah. So it isn't the same uh, meaning for the uh, sacrifice. The sacrifice. The yeah, yeah that was in that other verse. God has seen his sacrifice. What sacrifice was he making? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's running the show everywhere he goes, <laughs> and God tells everybody they got to give him a house. And. <laughs> All their property, and their the money, <laughs> their obedience. He's their mayor. He's <laughs> the commander of the legion. He's pr prophet. He's yeah. So uh, he gets to forgive sins like Jesus. Yeah, he's sacrificing so much. I uh, mean, he does die, but well, yeah, but he hasn't. Yeah, yeah right. God's already seen his sacrifice. Let's just try and figure out what ones we were making. <laughs> yeah. Making here. Yeah, when you're king of the world, what are your sacrifices exactly? Right. Yeah. Okay, verse 51, verily I say unto you, a commandment I have given unto mine handmaid, Emma Smith. What is a handmaid? Like I'm thinking of like a handmaid's tale. Yeah. Like why Why is the woman being called a handmaid? The wife, like the first wife. What does handmaid mean? Yeah, it's like a servant. Right? Yeah. Like I, I'm thinking of, Mar is it Margaret Atwood who did, who did yep. a handmaid's tale? Like yep. what? A what? female, a female servant. That's what the definition is. It, but isn't that? The word that is used on the Bible for you, I say Agar. What's her name? Like Sarah? Hagar. Hagar. Y yeah. So yeah. so she's a female she, servant. Uh, that's uh, what it says. Concubine, female servant. Because that's where that word comes from. On the Handmaid's Tale, the word handmaid comes from the Abraham's tale and how Sarah gives the handmaid yeah. Hagar to Abraham so she can have, so he can have yeah. kids. So Mormon Jesus, why are you calling? Emma, a handmaid. Yeah. Like a servant. Jen, you don't like that word. No. I'm like <laughs> physically biting my lips. <laughs> <laughs> okay, handmaid Emma. So a commandment. So, so Jesus is going to now give a commandment to servant Emma, your wife. Who, and then Jesus says, 
whom I have given unto you, that she stay herself and partake not of that which I commanded you to offer unto her. For I did it, saith the Lord, to prove you all as I did Abraham, and that I might require an offering at your hand by covenant and sacrifice. So what, what is Jesus saying here, or what is Joseph saying here about Emma and partaking not of that which Joseph was commanded to offer her? Do you so know? now he's changing the Abrahamic story again. Because in Emma's case, uh, Joseph's offering her something, and uh, maybe it looked like she was going to take it. So God said, that's enough. You've proved yourself. Just like with Abraham and Isaac, you don't have to go through with the sacrifice. But with Joseph, when they use the Abraham-Isaac story, Joseph gets to go through with whatever it was. Because if, if God's testing him by saying, you could take all these women, and that's the test, he didn't then get told he doesn't have to take them. Yeah. He yeah. he goes ahead and takes them then. So it's, he switched how he's using the story from Emma to Joseph. Why is why is Jesus saying I've given to you? Like I've give I've given Emma to you if Joseph eloped, like Joseph went and grabbed Emma, took her away from her home, and you know, when she got yeah. when he got married to her. Mm -hmm. So when when Jesus in this whole revelation is talking about I'm I'm giving you women, it's really saying you're Joseph. You know, like it's just weird. Why is God saying I gave you yeah. Emma? Yeah, when Joseph when they married before the church was even founded, before yeah, yeah and they the eloped and he went and yeah. took her. I want to get really but back to one point. Oh, Jen, were you gonna say something? I just am trying to figure out like um let's see. Stay her, she's she stay herself and partake not of that which I commanded you to offer unto her. Okay. Is that talking about William Law? Exactly. Okay. It, 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 that's what I was gonna ask. So, Sandra, okay, so yeah. my memory is Grant Palmer was the first that kind of called my attention to this. Grant Palmer, according to what I remember about Grant Palmer, he wrote at some point that Emma was getting mad about all the wives that Joseph Smith was taking. And she had a crush on William Law, who was in the first presidency by this point, the guy that ends up coming out with the Nauvoo Expositor and exposing all this polygamy. So what Grant Palmer claimed was that Joseph offered Emma William Law so that she could have a little piece on the side since he was getting so many pieces on the side. So there, there are some commenters as well. Matthew Allen is commenting in addition to you, Jen. Is that what's going on here where basically Joseph is saying, okay, Emma, Joseph, I told Joseph to give you William Law, but that was kind of this Abrahamic test, and now I'm pulling it back, and you don't have to go through with the sacrifice of taking on an extra husband. It, yes, I, I don't know how she makes sense of this section unless it's that kind of a scenario. Uh, but to me, it just shows that Joseph, it's like the power of the king, the king has the power to take all the women he wants, but the queen doesn't have the right to take all the men she wants. And once Joseph was faced with the thought, Emma might really go sleep with somebody else, he can't handle it. So he has to say, oh, God said, no, you passed your test, so you don't need to go through with that one now. And that that whole William Law, Emma thing, do you, does your memory sort of validate that there was probably yeah. something to that? Yeah, I kind of had the feeling that with all this um, ruckus that was going on for several years there about whether or not Joseph's Livy polygamy, all the rumors, newspaper exposés, all these things going on, and Emma evidently worried about which woman or girl Joseph might be trying to get to marry him or something, that she found a shoulder to cry on, in a sense, with William Law, that he evidently was a sympathetic figure for her to have someone to turn to uh, to talk about these things. So Joseph sees this affinity there and uh, so, oh, well, you know, God said, if you let me have mine, I can let you have William, thinking that she would uh, find that an attractive solution for her. But then he can't go through with it. So he has to tell her, nope, 
you passed the test, so now you don't get him. <laughs> yeah. And so again, this is Joseph doing this power grab of like, you know, and we're going to see it in the next verse. I'll just read it. Verse 52. And let mine handmaid, again, servant, Emma Smith, servant to Joseph, Emma Smith, receive all those that have been given unto my servant Joseph and who are virtuous and pure before me. And those who are not pure and have said they were pure shall be destroyed, saith the Lord God. So the first part of that is basically, you hear Joseph's in trouble. He's trying to justify the bad things he's done. He's offered William Law to Emma. And now when he has his chance to kind of make all things right, He's not only pulling back William Law from Emma and saying, okay, just kidding. Jesus says you don't get William Law anymore. And you have to be okay with all of the 22 wives that Joseph took before you. And he'll take a bunch more. And you, Emma, just have to like that and be okay with it. And Emma gets stuck with nothing. Like, that's a really interesting way to say I'm sorry for betraying you, right? Right. But yeah. I think the second half of this is the real kicker that he's trying to excuse evidently some of the women that he had uh marriages affairs whatever you want to call uh i assume people in the community must have known some of those women were not virtuous uh because he's trying to tell emma okay you don't have to accept the ones that said they were pure that weren't because uh, there's all this virgin talk, right? Like you're yeah. only supposed to take on virgins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, but then but, Joseph may be sleeping with women that weren't virgins. Well, yeah. Why else would you put this uh, exclude this exclusive policy statement in here? That well, if they said they were righteous and not, you don't have to accept <laughs> those ones. Okay, doesn't mean he's not. And they'll be destroyed, by the way. Oh yeah. So if, <laughs> if Joseph slept with women who claimed they were virtuous but they weren't. I, Jesus, I'm going to destroy those women, right? Well, and, right? And Emma, you shouldn't be mad that Joseph slept with those unvirtuous women because they lied to Joseph and said they were virtuous when they weren't. Is that what it's saying? That's what yeah. it's saying. But then he married women that were married. Yeah. Like, they're not virgins. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, um... But also, like, this is whole, oh, God's going to destroy the women. <laughs> you know what I mean? God's yeah. really, when's he ever destroying the men? He's always destroying the women. <laughs> What is that about, Sandra? <laughs> Sandra, why is Jesus so down on women? And why is Mormon Jesus so down on women? I just uh, because a narcissistic man started it all. <laughs> how did I, how I just like how did I not see any of this? I, know. I don't think how? we read it. We don't read it. Like, like I mean, the Kate like Albrecht read it. kept it. I read everything. Like I've read the Book of Mormon yeah. cover to cover. Like and I, the DNC, right? Yeah. No, like the whole book. Yeah. Like everything. Yeah. Like I. Yeah. I just sometimes I'm get so angry at myself too because I'm I'm smart. <laughs> like I am a smart woman. <laughs> I am a smart woman. I just don't understand. Yeah. How I was. I don't think I think if if you don't know what's going on in the background, you know the type, what Joseph, who Joseph was marrying, who he was not, and all that stuff. It's hard to put this into context if you don't do you, if you don't know the background story. Right, like yeah. with the William Law part. Right. That's true. Just reading this, you would have no clue. You would think, what in the world is this about? It <laughs> wouldn't make any sense to you. Yeah, exactly. Until you find out, ah, oh, there's more to the story. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, again, like you can think about so many issues today that, that God could have spent. And John Larson made this point. There's so many important issues God could have weighed in here because we really haven't had any significant revelations after Joseph Smith died other, th other than to roll back things <laughs> like polygamy, right? Yeah. Or, or blacks in the priesthood, right. priesthood ban. So God's got this precious real estate of scripture that he's going to be revealing. And it's all this sexual shenanigans between Joseph and women in the community and William Law and Emma. That's what jo That's what God really wants to spend you know, his the flaming his, sword and the angel on. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. what God's really caring about, you know, not, you know, other issues. Yeah. 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 I mean, probably an apologetic point that I just thought about is like, without this section, there's not a revelation anywhere else about eternal families and the power of sealing to, to seal. Man that's to woman. why they have to keep it in. Yeah. I think exactly. Yeah. That's the only reason I think they would otherwise have already changed it. Yeah. That's my guess, at yeah. least. 
Um, and again, really verse 52 is, is Joseph justifying the fact that he married 22 women without Emma's permission. Right. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. isn't that what it's about? And, and evidently a few <laughs> of them that she would have known that were not, uh, virtuous. <laughs> yeah. 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 So again, what's the likelihood that, that Jesus really is saying, Hey, Joseph, those 22 women you lied about, you know, the, the, they're fine. Mm -hmm. Emma, you need to forgive Joseph and allow that versus Joseph just trying to cover his tracks. Yeah. Claiming yeah. a revelation that never really happened. What's more likely? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we already know he did try and cover his track by sealing to the sisters twice. Right. So Emma could be there. Like right. we already see that pattern of him doing yeah. that now. Like Sandra, why didn't you, you speak for Jesus, Sandra? Why no. didn't <laughs> <laughs> why didn't Jesus just give this revelation at the beginning? Like in 1835, why didn't Jesus just give this revelation to Joseph in 1833? Well, he, he did. <laughs> they tell us that the in the footnotes for this stuff, they say God revealed this all to him back in 1831. Right. Because they realize it's too late that it doesn't make sense to give this after two dozen women. Yeah. But then that doesn't make sense that he's saying all this to Emma. Yeah. Right. It didn't happen yet. Yeah. Right. If he got the revelation back then, it exactly. hadn't happened yet. Like, you know, how, how many times do we read earlier in this section that God's not a God of confusion, that God's house yeah. is a house of order, oh, right? Yeah. I'm well, certainly freaking God, why didn't you reveal DNC 132 in 1831? Yeah. Why would have Emma, made everything. Emma's learning. It sounds like Emma's learning about this whole thing for the first time. Like, God is talking to Emma like she'd never heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. So much here. Um, I think next one is 53. Yeah, 53. For and, and I, on this one, God is talking to Emma. Okay. For I am the Lord thy God, and ye shall obey my voice, Emma. And I give unto my servant Joseph that he shall be made ruler over many things, for he hath been faithful over a few things, and from henceforth I will strengthen him. How many times does God need to tell Emma that Joseph has all power? <laughs> An authority. Well, it's evidently quite a bit because she's not getting the point. <laughs> it's just like every other verse, God is saying, Joseph is the most powerful being <laughs> ever to see, you know. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, 54. And I command mine handmaid servant, Emma Smith, again, servant to Joseph, to abide and cleave unto my servant, Joseph, keywords here, and to none else. But if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord. For I am the Lord thy God and will destroy her if she abide not in my law. So Joseph gets to have sex with as many women as he wants. If Emma has sex with any other man, she'll be destroyed. She's yeah. destroyed. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how many times God has to keep telling her she's going to be destroyed. <laughs> Why are the women who are in polyandrous relationships not being destroyed? Because they're... Why? I don't know. That's like, why is this threat being done to Emma, but not to, you know, all like the 12, 13 women that Are were already married. married to other men? Because I think Brian Hales and everyone else in the church would, would say mm. that the polyandrous wives of Joseph Smith were probably still sleeping with their actual husbands, right? And so are they, are they being destroyed? There's no exceptions for the no. polyandrous relationships here yeah. correct yeah yeah and again like like jesus is saying to emma accept polygamy or i will destroy you well yes how does that jive with the jesus you believe in sandra, <laughs> sandra? well that's not the way he treated the woman caught in adultery i mean the picture of the new testament of christ in the gospels is not this condemning God who's threatening every other verse to destroy you if you don't obey something that she would feel was immoral. I mean, this is, you're being threatened about not participating in an immoral, illegal act. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, think about this. Think about what these verses mean to all the women in the church today. What is going to happen uh, yeah. to the ones that 
died before their husbands, who their husbands resealed themselves to other uh, women for eternity. What does it mean for, you know, like in heaven for, for women who like, is God going to be threatening them? You know, why would he threaten Emma and not threaten you as a woman in the church later in heaven um, to enter into polygamy? Um, there, I know this, there's this whole rhetoric about, um, oh, but there's agency and like women, you shouldn't worry about what's going to happen in heaven because there's agency. But this is on the scriptures. Exactly, like exactly. what Emma shouldn't be the exception here. Like this is should be be applied to all the women in the church later. Or yeah, or not at all. Like, yeah, Mormons believe in free agency. Why is Emma being told, accept Joseph's 30 plus women, or I will destroy you? Shouldn't Emma be able to have something to say about that? But then, but then huh. the second thing is. Why is Emma destroyed if she doesn't practice polygamy, like you said, Gerardo, but modern Mormon women are being told, if you don't want to enter into polygamy, you won't have to. That's what that's what Mormon women are being told today. So why do modern Mormon women have polygamy as optional, but for Emma, she would, not only was it not optional, she would be destroyed if she didn't practice it. Right. Right? Right. Right. It's a different rule. Yeah. But it's a heinous, like, yeah. what type of God is that, right? <laughs> to me, well, it's Joseph's yeah. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To me, this is, exactly, this is Joseph's God, and today's God that the church has created has nothing to do with the God that Joseph was envisioning. Yeah, yeah. It's like, Joseph can have sex with as many women as he wants. Emma, you can't have sex with anybody but Joseph. And if you don't accept all the women that Joseph's going to take on, I will destroy you, says Jesus. Yeah. yeah, this is awful. Yeah, this is awful. Is it not awful? Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, and and you think about all the women that felt the weight of that on their shoulders in trying to weigh out an act that all their senses told them was wrong, was immoral, mm -hmm. was not Christian, and they have to weigh that against Joseph's. God telling them, it doesn't matter what I've said in the past. I'm telling you now, you have to accept this or be destroyed. I mean, that's a big, hefty choice they've got to make on uh, whether to accept this polygamy because you're accepting a God that operates this way then. Yeah. That just condemns you right and left for stuff that your husband doesn't get condemned for. Yeah. And then they wonder why a 14 year old felt coerced into marrying 37 year old man. Yeah. Like when, when they're being taught or when, you know, the men are speaking this way and yeah. that Joseph is basically God and he has the chance to either save their family or condemn and curse their family forever. And then you're, yeah, there's no, there's no. Yeah choice there there's no like for a young child put like it's just yeah it i'm just angry <laughs> yes it's not agency <laughs> yeah exactly and yeah. i'm beating a dead horse here but i really want to drive this point home which is women in the church if you're still in the church believing why do you think you're gonna get special treatment in in heaven when emma didn't get that like, why would you, as a woman in the church today, get something that Emma didn't get, which was the choice to live polygamy? Why are you over Emma? Why are you above Emma? And we know that Russell M. Nelson, current exactly. prophet, yep. has two, he's sealed the two women in heaven. And Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the Mormon church, is sealed the two women. Why isn't polygamy the the destiny of all Mormon women. Why? Right. And it, it they don't stop to think about it that because <clears throat> they'll say to me in the bookstore at times that, well, God won't <clears throat> force us to live polygamy if we don't want to. And like Geraldo was saying, well, then why did Emma have to live it? Why couldn't she say it's my agency and I choose not to yeah. participate in that? Yeah. Yep. And yeah. yet, <clears throat> according to Mormonism, 
top two guys in the church are going to live polygamy. It is not a dead doctrine. It is a very current thing. If you really believe Mormonism, you would really need to think this through, that this is the promise of the Mormon God. I've got to either accept this or I'm not believing that God. Um, and I feel bad for all these women through the centuries that have been forced to choose the Mormon God over their own conscience. Yeah. A couple good comments coming in. Faith, well, several, but I'll read a few. Faith Mary Peerer writes, I grew up in the UAB polygamous cult, the United Apostolic Brethren, Brethren is that yeah. UAB? And section 132 was talked about over the pulpit often. Emma was endlessly bashed and made to be an example of a bad plural wife. So DNC 32 yeah. in a polygamous cult was often used to keep the women. current yeah. women in check, in line, in check. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. And then the, the wonderful Maven, hey Maven, she writes, I've learned agency in the church is always, quote, agency to accept what God says or not, as in polygamy. The women today don't know the choice is literally the same. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Maven. Yeah. yeah. And David A. Bettner, A. Bettner teaches a lot about this in the church today, that members in the church do not really have agency because they already decided as soon as they got baptized into the church, they decided to do whatever it's commanded of them by their leaders, by the prophet, and by God. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. And we 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 just got an amazing super chat from Bryce Jones. So we just want to shout out and thank Bryce Jones and everyone who is uh donating to support this. We really, we really do appreciate it. Okay, what verse are we on? Um 55. 55. But if she, Emma, will not abide this commandment, then shall my servant Joseph do all things for her even as he hath said, and I will bless him and multiply him and give unto Joseph him an hundredfold in this world of fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, houses and lands, wives and children, and crowns of eternal lives in the eternal worlds. So not just a crown, but crowns Joseph's going to get. Wives, children, houses, lands, sisters and brothers, fathers and mothers. Sandra, what is what is Joseph saying here that Jesus is? Uh, well, saying? it's kind of crazy uh, <laughs> because he's saying, okay, if she <clears throat> she doesn't accept polygamy, so you think that okay, what's he going to do? Condemn her again, or is he going to give her something good? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, if she doesn't accept it, then Joseph is supposed to do everything for her. Okay, that sounds good. All right, Emma's yeah. getting a break here. He did everything for her, even as he said, and I will bless him and multiply him and give him wives. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. <laughs> we just took a U-turn on this. It started out sounding like, oh, okay, something nice is going to happen to, to Emma. Emma right. Not, no, no, Joseph, because, because that's the way it went. Joseph's going to give all this stuff from God, including all the wives he wants and children. And eternal lives, plural, that means bazillion kids from whatever number of wives he wants to take. So, I, I mean, mean it, it almost sounds like God's saying, Emma, I'm already giving Joseph a bunch of wives, but if you don't accept it, I'm going to give him wives and children and crowns and eternal lives forever and ever, like a hundredfold. It's like <laughs> I'm going to even give him more wives, either allow him to have the wives that we're, I'm going to give him now, yeah. or I'm going to give him even more wives later. Right. Is so that where, is that? Yes. Where's the agency in this? <laughs> this is so sad when it's, you consider the children that Emma had lost. It is so sad. Right? Yeah. What do you mean, Hirota? Because we know that she had several children who died. Yeah. Um, and And Joseph is here saying, well, if you don't accept this, then God is going to give me a bunch of children that aren't children. yours. Yeah, I? exactly. Yeah. 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 Wives and children from others in the community. And houses not you. and lands, probably everything <laughs> that her little heart has desired for yeah. the last 
how many years of being by his side and building up this church with him. <laughs> and then in one swoop, he's just going to like take everything that's dear and to her heart and that she's wanted forever. Yeah. And just like smack her with it. Yeah. That's, that is like a monster. <laughs> yeah. To be yeah. honest, that's so sad. You just wonder at this point, <laughs> how is Emma feeling hearing this read to her? I just, I can't imagine. And Joseph doesn't have the gall to read it himself. No, no. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. No wonder. He sent Hiram. Was it Hiram? He, sent Hiram. he sends Hiram. Hiram. He sends, he sends Hiram. <laughs> yes. And he, Hiram says, I never received such a severe talking to as he did when he took that to Emma. So we know when she's hearing all this, it's not going down well because she's getting madder and madder, evidently. And can I just say one crown isn't enough. He gets yeah. crowns. Yeah. And eternal, <laughs> eternal lives. lives. What it says Plural, lives. Eternal but... lives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> crowns and thrones and lives and women and men and children and worlds. parents and worlds. And... All <laughs> again it points to this power trip he's on. <laughs> it's not enough to be God. He's gotta be super God. <laughs> <laughs> And this is Jesus who's saying all this. Is, oh, it's, I mean, we're laughing, Jen, and then you always bring it back to how bring it back to how terrible. Uh, and is. then I'm over here crying. <laughs> yeah, like, it's a, yeah, it's so it's sad. It's almost like Thanos. Like it's, it's like Thanos Jesus. Yeah, you know? yeah. I feel that's why I feel like I'm like angry. It's like I'm going through my whole faith crisis in like a couple hours here. <laughs> You're like angry and then mad and then you cry and then you're you're like, why did I believe this? And it's just this circle <laughs> that you go in for a little while. Oh, it's just so. All right. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Um, verse, uh, we're 50. making good progress here. Verse 56. <laughs> and again, verily I say, let mine handmaid or servant Forget my servant, Joseph. Okay, at least Joseph's a servant. Okay, we're throwing a bone. So I guess Joseph's a servant to God, but Emma's a servant to Joseph. So anyway, yeah. forgive my servant, Joseph, his trespasses. Okay, so now Emma's got to forgive Joseph his trespasses. And then shall she be forgiven her trespasses, wherein she has trespassed against me. And I, the Lord thy God, will bless her and multiply her and make her heart rejoice. So what's going on here, Sandra? Well, I think this is the second time that she's told she's got to forgive Joseph his trespasses, and uh, then she'll be forgiven. I mean, wow. Uh, 22 wives later, uh, if she'll forgive him for all of this. I mean, when you think about it, going behind her back, I mean, like once a month or twice a month, whatever it is, that he's going off and taking a new wife and just racking up the numbers there in Nauvoo. And she's got to forgive all of this, all this duplicity. I mean, people just can't imagine what this means. <clears throat> Joseph's supposed to be a busy guy running a church, running a city. <clears throat> and yet he's got time to take a wife every month. Uh, and that has to be affecting Emma. The time he's away from home with her wondering, is he off getting another wife? What's he doing? And <clears throat> But she's got to forgive him. She, if she wants forgiveness, she has to forgive him. And there is no comparison of what Joseph's doing and betraying her uh, to her burning the dinner or something. I mean, what's the big sins she's supposed to have done? Yeah, what did Emma do? Again, that's the narcissistic playbook. It's blame reversal. Right? right. Yeah. Like Joseph has done all these horrible <laughs> things to Emma. And now, now Emma all of a sudden has sins. How, what do Emma's sins have anything to do with section 132? <laughs> right. right. Can someone yeah. tell me? He sold himself to 22 <laughs> women before he told her. And all of a sudden, and she Emma has sins. sins? <laughs> like she has sins. Yeah. Like really? <laughs> oh, yeah. And again, <laughs> Mormon Jesus, there's a conflict of interest for Mormon Jesus to be allegedly telling Joseph to tell Emma that Emma needs to forgive Joseph, and that's the only way Emma's going to get her sins forgiven. 
you should know, Mormon Jesus, that you shouldn't be telling Joseph to tell Emma this because that's too conveniently serving to Joseph. It's too self-serving. Which is why you have your brother go do it. Because <laughs> you know it won't go down good if you do. But this idea of, <clears throat> of leaders forgiving sins, I mean, it still carries on today. Yeah, Isn't that why you go to your bishop yeah. to confess and then mm -hmm. he tells you if you've been forgiven? He tells you why, how many months you can't go without the sacrament and then can't go to have me, the temple recommend right, and miss ordinances and have to meet with him again to see if God has finally forgiven you and so you can get back into fellowship. Yeah, that's Sandra. You know, people ask me if I'm ever going to believe again. I will never believe that any human on the earth has the right to decide whether I'm forgiven by no. God. Yeah. No. Is that fair? Right. Do you yeah. believe that any human on earth has the right to tell you whether or not God's forgiven you or Jesus has forgiven you? Well, I think you should know whether he has. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's between you and God. Yeah. And we've seen too many people <clears throat> pass judgment on people where they have no knowledge really of the person at all. So we've all been burned by those that have felt they could put judgment on us. And so we resonate with the problem for poor Emma of the kind of double bind that she's put in with this. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's, this is so coercive and insulting to Emma and it just really is um, narcissistic. Um, all right. 57. And again, I say, let not my servant Joseph put his property out of his hands lest an enemy come and destroy him. For Satan seeketh to destroy, for I am the Lord thy God, and he is my servant. And behold, and lo, I am with him, as I was with Abraham thy father, even unto his exaltation and glory. What property is, is being discussed here that, that shouldn't be put out of Joseph's hands? Since it appears in the polygamy revelation, Right. <laughs> if, if we say it has some context to what we've been discussing, I would think it means, Emma, I can't give up the 22 I got before I asked you about it. Yeah. Because God's already given them to me. But here it's literally calling the women property. Yes. Like that's kind of explicit, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, lo that somehow if Joseph gives up his plural wives... Satan is going to destroy his him. property. So not well, God, that God happened. Not there you are. He, he, Isn't that interesting? Like for Emma, God destroys Emma, but then for Joseph, <laughs> if he leaves his wife, Satan is going to come and destroy him. Mm. Yeah. So if <laughs> Emma doesn't let Joseph practice yeah. polygamy, she'll be destroyed. If by Joseph God. has to stop practicing polygamy, He'll be destroyed by Satan. By Satan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Satan's got a lot of power. Yeah. Here. A anything else about about this verse? It's so awful. And with him, I was yeah, I don't know. All right. 58. Now, as touching the law of the priesthood, there are many things pertaining thereto. Thereunto. Okay, 59. So this is some important stuff. God, this is kind of God, you know, God and Jesus are, are finishing up. up this section, right? <laughs> yep. He's summing up the, I mean, this is what? The new and everlasting covenant, right? Yes. So this is the new, new and everlasting covenant. That's how it began. Now we're summarizing the new and everlasting covenant. So pay attention, everyone. Jesus wants to summarize. Here it is. Verse 59. Verily, if a man be called of my father, as was Aaron, by mine own voice, and by the voice of him that sent me, and I have endowed him with the keys of the power of this priesthood. If he do anything in my name and according to my law and by my word, he will not commit sin and I will justify him. Oh my goodness. What is being said here, everyone? Like if it hasn't been made clear before yeah. in the 58 verses yeah. before, what is Jesus reiterating here, Sandra? Well, he's got all the power. Uh, doesn't matter what he does. It's right, saying God, if, if he, Joseph, do anything in my name and according to my law and by my word, he will not commit sin and I will justify him. Well, it's basically saying Joseph could do whatever he wants. Is it yeah, not? I wonder why it's there. Why, the second what is, anointing? 
Yeah. It's like <laughs> Joseph can do whatever he wants. Yeah. If he claims it's from God, it's, it's not a sin by definition. It's not a sin right. and it's righteous. If Joseph says it's of God. Yeah. Did I read that wrong? Yeah. It seems like it's another <laughs> power trip. Yeah. That's like, he's the, impervious. Joseph is literally can't sin at this point. Joseph can't sin. Right. Is that not what it's saying? Yeah. Well, if, if you take into account what the happiness letter says, you know, that Joseph gets to dictate what even things that look bad or would be bad in some contexts all of a sudden are good in other contexts. And Joseph is the one that gets to decide what's good. Then yeah, he can't, he can't do anything that's wrong. Yeah. 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 Joseph cannot sin. Joseph, Joseph is transcended sin. If Joseph does it, it's God, God loves it. Yeah. Right. Well, if Joseph does it, then it's just, then it is God's will. Right. Whatever he does is God's will. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Such a power grab. All right. Verse 60. Let no one therefore set on my servant, Joseph, for I will justify him, for he shall do the sacrifice which I require at his hands for his transgressions, saith the Lord your God. Again, Jen, what is this saying? <laughs> um, the same thing over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> but it's basically saying no one can criticize Joseph, right? Yeah. Yeah. He, well, he, yeah, he's basically saying he's Jesus. Because even if he, yeah. so anything he does is good. But even if it is bad, I'm going to forgive him anyway, right? <laughs> and no one I should criticize him, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Like it's literally saying, let no one set on my servant Joseph. What does that mean, set on? Uh, uh, nobody attack him on this. And I think this is <laughs> aimed at Emma. Yeah. You know, quit uh, haranguing him about all of this. It's all from God. And that's his sacrifice is to take all of these two dozen women and um, that God required from him. And uh, so don't worry about it, Emma. It's all good. Yeah. And then here, here for me in verse 61, this is one of the worst verses of the whole, and that's saying a lot, right? This is one of the yeah. worst verses, most explicit and worst verses for me of DNC 132, verse 61. And again, as pertaining to the law of the priesthood, if any man espouse a virgin and desire to espouse another, so again, it's the desire, right? And the first give her consent, and if he espouse the second, and they are virgins and have vowed to no other man, then is he justified. He cannot commit adultery, for they are given unto him, for he cannot commit adultery with that <laughs> that belongeth unto him and to no one else. There's so much wrong with that verse. Does anyone want to enumerate? Well, right at the start when he says, if, okay, if a guy marries the first virgin and then he desires to take another one, the first one gives her consent. Wait, first off, Sandra, does the guy have to be a virgin? Evidently, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter if the guy's a virgin. Okay, keep going. But then when he goes on to say they can, he can keep taking them like that. But what happened to the first one given the consent? So that's the law of Sarah, right? Yeah. So that the, that the first wife has to give consent, right? So none of the other wives have to give consent if he keeps racking up more wives. <laughs> so wives two, wife two, three, and four don't, don't, they don't to, count. They don't okay, get to, okay. no, they have no say in this matter. And again, Joseph violated this law because and again, they have didn't to be have, virgin, virgins that? and they have to be virgins, which they weren't because they were married to other men yeah, and they weren't a virgin. Yeah. If at least 11 or 12 of the wives yeah. Joseph took yeah. Some were, of them were, were married to other men, yeah. they weren't virgins right. and he's violating his own law here. Yeah. But then yeah. Joseph, whatever Joseph does is That's right true. and is forgiven by God. So he gets a pass. Yep. Right. Yep. I think you said that once. <laughs> a few times. <laughs> okay, what else? What else is wrong with this? Uh, with this verse, um, is it sixty-one again? Yeah, sixty-one. Yeah. And again, it's saying this language: "For they are given unto him, Jen. Mm -hmm. For they are given unto him." Anything wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can't give another human being. I just want to make that clear: no giving, no giving of women. 
but it belongeth to him. This, that's what exactly. it they don't belong he, to you. They, he, it, it they says, don't. for he cannot commit adultery. They're not your property. Exactly. Everything wrong. <laughs> the but, women belong unto the man. That's what Jesus is saying, Doctrine Covenants 132. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting that he's zeroing in on these virgins because if you look at the timeline on this, these 22 wives he already had, that's where you get most of the married women. But now recently, at this point, he's got these young girls staying in the home and he starts marrying these teenagers. So we start off with mostly married women and then it gradually goes to these teenagers. Younger and younger. Younger and younger. And so this is evidently something that would have been very current on Emma's mind, the Partridge sisters and the Lawrence sisters. Uh, so that, okay, so we assume they were virgins. And so Emma would know that. So he's appealing to her, well, these girls are virgins. See, so, so there was nothing wrong there. Uh, overlooking the fact that he had all these married women as wives that she didn't know about. As far as we know, we did, she didn't know about the married women. Yeah. And the knowledge that she has seems to be at this late point with the young women that four of them that she said he could take. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, let's just do a thought experiment here. Let's say in 2022, right. Um, let's say there's a Mormon man who um, there's a Mormon man who marries his first wife. He's sealed to her. She dies. And then he wants to take a, a second Mormon wife. True or false, the church will allow him to get sealed to a second wife. True or false? Yeah. True. 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 Okay. So he picks a woman he wants to be sealed to, but let's just say that she was previously married and it had sex. In the modern Mormon church, can this fictitious man, hypothetical man, marry this second woman, get sealed to her in the eternities, even though she's already had sex? Is there any... Is there any evidence that the Mormon church enforces this virginity rule, which is enshrined in the scriptures? When Dallin H. Oaks took his second wife, was she a virgin? I think she we was. Assume Maybe, so. <laughs> I guess Russell and Nelson's wife might have been, yeah. but was Dallin H. Oaks' second wife a virgin? Um, and I imagine so. I think that's kind of a requirement for those guys. But let's just say it's somebody that had, you know, joined the church, a convert who had had. Yeah. sex previously are they no it's not a rule it's that it's enforced no. yeah no but, no, but it's the there only, the scriptures <laughs> yeah it's right but, there they got to be virgins <laughs> the only thing <clears throat> requirement is that she hasn't been sealed in the temple to somebody else and it, they don't at the, as far as i know they don't require anything else of her to qualify assuming that she's a good mormon but it wouldn't matter if she had been married before uh, well, it wouldn't matter if she had been a harlot before because she could repent of that and still go and get married in the temple as long as she hadn't been sealed to someone else. So it has nothing to do with her morality. It has to do with whether she was sealed to someone else. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Sandra, Social Islander is reminding us of a very important point that we've mentioned in the previous episodes. Uh -huh. What literally did Jesus say about marriage in heaven? We, we there should probably is no marriage in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, Matthew did makes Jesus that very clear. Did Jesus mince his words? Did he no. stutter? Did Jesus no, stutter? No, it seemed to be pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like all of this is completely unbiblical, right? One would think. <laughs> unbiblical and against the Book of Mormon. Like one wonders <laughs> why Doctrine and Covenants 1, uh, 32 exists. Now, why he, didn't Alma or King Benjamin reveal... Yeah. DNC 132, it right? It goes against the Book of Mormon. <laughs> yeah, right. Because it gets them all mixed up on this who had kids, when, and what. If you throw in Jacob from the Book of Mormon, right. where it's right. only to have children right. to raise up seed. And yet none of this has to do with raising up. Joseph's wives have nothing to do with raising up seed. So they can't use the excuse of, oh, there's an exception in the Book of Jacob that he could have uh, more wives because God commanded him. Well, God supposedly commands them only if it's a matter of raising up children, which he didn't do. So yeah. there's the conundrum. Yep. All right. Verse 60. Oh, do you have more? No. Go okay. Ahead. Verse 62. 
This is, Jen, I want you to tell me what the point of this verse is, okay? Okay. And if he have 10 virgins given unto him by this law, he cannot commit adultery. For they belong to him, and they are given unto him, therefore he is justified. Can you summarize what Jesus is wanting to make really clear here, Jen? What's the purpose of that verse? That he can have as many wives as he wants. Yeah, like, we're not just talking two. We're not just talking <laughs> five. Yeah. If he wants ten, he can have it, right? Yeah. I mean, isn't yeah. that... Is it sort of like there's no minimum here? Yeah. Right? He yeah. just wants to make, God, Jesus wants to make sure it's really clear. There's no minimum to the number of wives that, that yeah. the man, the virgins that the man can bring on. Mm -hmm. It's just really interesting that <laughs> online, online, do you know the number 10 has a reference? And if you click on it, mm. it, get, it takes you to verse 48, which is talking about, um, Joseph is not condemned, basically, and shall be without condemnation on earth and in heaven. Yeah, kind of interesting. That's funny that they would refer back to right. that. Yeah, saying mm -hmm. that whatever God's what whatever God gives him, he can take it. Whatever he wants, God will give he him. Can have it. He yeah. can have it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's basically no limit to the number of wives a man can have. I mean, isn't that really what sixty two is saying? Yeah. Oh, but I think there is. Who was it that <laughs> was it Kimball that had so many wives sealed to him? And there was some kind of statement about you couldn't have more than 999 <laughs> or something. Is, is that okay, Jen? Does that feel better that at least 900. there's a cap at 999? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's a, there's a mathematical problem here. I, that women are worth a fraction of what the men are. Yeah. They're, they're not, only, not only are our women owned and given to and belonged belonging to the man, but but they're they're a death a ten pennies to a dollar, right? Ten ten pennies to a dime, ten dimes to a dollar. Women are worth a fr isn't that what's kind of yeah. implicit here? Women are worth a fraction of what men are worth. Yeah. Am I am I is that am I overstating that? Is that the well, message you're getting, Jen? No. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm not seeing any worth given to women in this chapter at all. Yeah. And, and then you got numerically the problem <laughs> of how they're going to find all these women because there, we don't have that kind of disproportionate number of women to men in the real world. So I don't know where they all get these hundreds of women and like when you look at the list of the wives that the men in Nauvoo had the guys coming out to Utah um I mean you start off with Joseph and Brigham with numbers up um anywhere from 30 to 50 or so there's several of them that have those big numbers but they get out to Utah they can't sustain that and so other than the wealthy guys the local farmer usually is only going to get one or two wives there just weren't enough women to go around when they get out here to, ha to have it practiced at the rate Joseph practiced it. No one else could have that kind of harem. Yeah. And, and, and by the, and, and just to refer back to a point we made in a previous episode, what the church wants to sort of say here in terms of the numbers is women, you should feel flattered. So Sandra and Jen, you should feel flattered because what this means is numerically that women are just on average more righteous than men. And so God's got to make some accommodation for the large number of righteous men versus the smallest, smaller number of righteous, no, large right. number of righteous women versus the smaller number of righteous men. And so women, you should feel happy that God's basically saying women on average are more righteous than men. That's what, that's, what, that's, that's the cool thing here. Yeah. <laughs> Are you feeling better? So, no. Yes. <laughs> feeling better already. <laughs> so we're, and then we're rewarded with being a polygamous wife that we didn't want to be and <laughs> having children for eternity. Not Eternal just that. But, spirits. But your names won't be known. Your your children can't pray to you. They can right. only pray to the guy. They can't talk. 
And you can't about talk us. about you. Yeah, this we last can't. conference, uh, one of the guys, I don't remember who it oh, was. Oh, you're just making me so angry, John. <laughs> Stop talking. It's Jesus. Stop it's not, adding it's more Jesus. to it. The polygamy it's, is enough. It's don't Mormon add, Jesus. It's not me, Jen. Don't don't add Heavenly Mother into this because I'm already upset about polygamy. You were saying. So, <laughs> well, so, at sorry, this Jen. last <laughs> conference, one of the general authorities was talking about Heavenly Mother. And or was it Nelson that said it? That. Uh, well, you guys have read the scriptures, you know, as much about it as I do, Ren which I thought Ren was a little curious. Um, <laughs> what good is this guy? If he doesn't know any more than me, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that's a good point. Anyways. Um, yeah, we're going to have an awful lot of heavenly mothers up there. So yeah, but that's why they tell us we can't pray to heavenly mother. Cause we don't know which one it is. <laughs> so. Yeah, but something to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> There's a comment from Max George. Max writes, I do wish John was more angered by this than amused. I love you, John, but I don't find it amusing. So, I mean, I, I handle, I mean, we all handle emotions in different ways. Yeah. If you think that by me making jokes about this or laughing about it means I'm not angered, I think you're misunderstanding how I deal with emotion. Um, you know, and I could be ragey, frothy at the mouth. Uh, that's just, I don't know. This is just how I deal. But I, I think you would be mistaken, uh, Max George, to interpret my joking about this as not being angry. Right. And I think there is a level of frustration. The more you study Mormon history, the yeah. more angry you can become. Yeah. And so at some point you have to vent. <laughs> Because it's just so ridiculous that uh, we all were put under such uh, brainwashing and uh, guilt about not being obedient to these people. And then you find out, well, they didn't honor my devotion. They didn't do their part. As they were supposed to be the righteous men that we were submitting to. And we allowed ourselves to submit to them because we really believed they were righteous men. And then to find out that, that that sacrifice that we made to follow these men meant nothing, that they just got to do whatever they wanted and uh, the rest of the flock just had to fall in line. Yeah. It, it's so, um, well, disappointing is the wrong word. I can't think of the word. It's just, uh, it's such a mockery of all the members sincerity in honoring what these men say, then to see the duplicity that the leaders have practiced through the years. Uh, so to stay sane, we can't stay angry every day. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and also in addition to the anger that we all are feeling, and I'm not going to feel it like Jen is yeah. feeling, or I'm not a woman. Yeah. And I live, I still benefit from pat patriarchal structures and, and all yeah. that. So, so there, there is truth to what's being said that, that it's probably a lot less funny to a woman than it is to a man. So I actually concede that. And I, I do want to be respectful about that. So, so yeah, that's fair. So I, I mean no disrespect and I apologize if that comes across, but I also want to say, isn't this ludicrous? Like, isn't yeah. DNC, it is tragic and yeah. awful, Yeah, yeah. But, but isn't it also just preposterously, ludicrously ridiculous? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's just so crazy <clears throat> that you didn't see this before. Like it's, it, it is. And I, and I'm not kidding when like my emotions during this are, are full circle. Like I'm, I'm angry and then I'm sad and then. I want to just cry for them. And then mm -hmm. I want to cry for women now that are still in it and, and don't see it. And, Oh, it's just yeah. hard. It's just hard. Well, it's like the book, uh, ghost of polygamy past. Is that all? Carolyn title? Pearson's book. We should put that yeah. in the show notes. Okay, the yeah. the yeah. ghost of eternal polygamy mm -hmm. by Carolyn Pearson, an amazing book. We've had her on Mormon stories to talk about the book. So let's include a link to the book and to that episode, but go ahead, Cinder. So many people say, well, polygamy is way in the past. It's over. It, you know, it doesn't affect me or I was from pioneer. I wasn't from pioneer stock. And so, uh, I don't have polygamy in my background. It's irrelevant to me. 
but it is relevant in that it is given as a part of their scriptures. And if you really believe Mormonism, the woman is faced with the possibility, uh, if she dies before her husband, that he can take a second wife, or depends on if he has sickly wives, maybe he can go through quite a few of them, but he can get more women. And the, this woman will, ha the first wife has no say on this. Well, each wife has no say once they've died. And so her book shows all these women today that struggle with this concept of what if I die first, I couldn't handle it in the resurrection to meet my husband at the bar of God. And, and here he's standing with several women, you know, that they, it, that it is a current living problem for the Mormon woman. It isn't just something that happened 150 years ago. It's part of their life today of what could happen to them. And it's very uh, sad that women go through this kind of uh, turmoil. In my own family, my grandpa outlived his, my grandma, and he married again a lady he met at the rest home. And uh, <laughs> according to Mormonism, he will be a polygamist in heaven. So when people tell me, oh, it's an old doctrine, it's not relevant anymore, I say, oh, okay, well then, Effie that married my grandpa in his old age, does she then not have a husband for eternity? Is she cut out of the picture again? I mean, she married him with the assumption that this would get her eternal life. She had her ceiling then for this. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense that when people say, oh, well, we have agency. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to stick with the plan. If you don't want to be in that, you don't have to. It just makes havoc of the whole concept of uh, family ceilings then. Yeah. Another another thing when we talk about the ludicrousness, if that's a word, or the ridiculousness of this is, how is DNC 132 not blown up Mormonism? Like I had a friend once tell me, right when I got into Mormon studies, he said, if you wanna hide something from a Mormon, put it in a book. Yeah. And in this case, this isn't just like in the Journal of Discourses. This isn't just in the Times and Seasons. TNC 132 is in canonized Mormon scripture and somehow it, it hasn't affected the church at all. And it's Most, all right there. They don't read it. <laughs> or when they read it, they just read it to be through reading it, not to contemplate what it says. But I've talked to women that have, they tell me they haven't seriously read 132. I had a girlfriend that I connected with years after I left the church and we were sharing different things. And <clears throat> I think there had been some sort of polygamy story in the news. It may have been back when Warren Jeffs was being chased around. And uh, I asked her how she felt about polygamy. Oh, that was then. This is now. And she was just dismissive of it all. And I said, well, yeah, but what do you do with the people today that take a second wife because their wife died? Well, God will sort it out. And there are always these excuses. And I said, but if you read Section 132, it is still part of the Mormon doctrine. And she couldn't face that she didn't believe polygamy. She thought that was a mistake, but she couldn't face that it was in their scriptures and she was stuck with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like that the black menaces. My shirt. Uh, <laughs> they so I don't know if you know this, Sandra, but they they are on this new hip app called TikTok. And what they're BYU students, and they go around and interview students on campus, um, and they ask them questions, usually about race and like what do you think about racism at BYU yeah. and stuff like that. But there's this one video where they go and ask students, girl students at BYU, do you think there's going to be polygamy in heaven? Yeah. And I think all of the girls are like, I've never thought about that. Yes, it's like. How have you never thought about that? You're at BYU. The name Brigham Young should <laughs> ring a bell. Everyone knows he had multiple wives. Uh, yes. Most of them probably have been members their whole lives. They know that their prophet is married to two women for eternity. The, say, the, uh, the first counselor or second counselor at Dallin H. Oaks as well. And they've never, like, to some of these girls, this guy's had, like, the interviewer had to explain because they would be like, 
like the girls would be like, what do you mean? Yeah. And and like the interviewer would ask, well, just like Russell M. Nelson is married to two women for eternity. Do you think that he's going to have both <laughs> wives in heaven? And the women, and the girls are like, well, kind of like, I don't know. Yes. And, and I had that exact experience while I was at BYU, Idaho, um, talking to a friend of mine who, I mean, she was a member of the church and everything. And, and, we were discussing this same topic and because she had just gotten engaged. She was about to get married and I don't know how it came up, but it, I brought, brought up the fact that if she, it came up that if she ever died, her husband might marry another woman for eternity. And then he would have both of them in heaven. And she was like, well, but if I didn't want to, then like, I'll, I'll, I'll have a choice. And I said, but how are you going to have a choice? You'll be, I mean, it sounds bad, but you'll be dead by then. Yeah. And your husband's going to be sealed. Like the ceilings can't be, you know, un just undone, just cuss. She's going to, he's going to be sealed to both of you. And she just, as the more she thought about it, she just started crying. And she had been a member of, of the church her whole life and she had never thought about it. Right. And it's just crazy how more and more uh, women or, you know, my age in the church, have never thought about it because the church has been able to hide this section in plain sight and not talk about it. Well, they keep emphasizing free agency. Right, right. And so that just becomes a covering for all the problem areas. Well, there's free agency. John. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, like you said, it's it's just it's just kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's super crazy, and no one's thought about it. And yeah, I was just—I was just noticing you, you brought up black menaces again. Like, I'm seeing articles just this week released yeah. on Newsweek and KUER and uh, um, Insider.com. Like, the this is the week where the black menaces really hit national recognition. Mm -hmm. So we're you know we're, we'll be including links to uh <clears throat> their tiktok and instagram pages but please buy their merch i think the, <laughs> the shirts might be sold out but Aww. support them because they're worth supporting i should have yeah. worn mine today next, next time. time next time next time yeah next time okay well we've we've got a couple of verses to go um so uh are we at 63 is that right um but if one or either of the 10 virgins <sighs> after she is espoused shall be with another man she has committed adultery and shall be destroyed for they are given unto him to multiply or replenish the earth according to my commandment and to fulfill the promise which was given by my father before the foundation of the world and for their exaltation in the eternal worlds that they may bear the souls of men <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry that they may bear the souls of men i guess the female babies aren't important there like what <laughs> that they may bear the souls of men for herein is the work of my father not my father and mothers uh the work of my father continued that he not he and she and them uh, may be glorified. All right. So what's this one saying, Sandra? Help us out with this one. <laughs> well, it just goes on and on. Uh, it's just more of the same. It just multiplies um, the women as property to for all generations to come. But it's saying, it's just making it really clear that these polygamous wives can't have sex with other men, right? Nope, right. Or they'll, or they'll yep. be destroyed, That's right? That's right. I, yeah. I, took, I made a count of that at one time. And like there's about 10 or 11 times they use the word destroyed, destroyed through this section. Yeah. <laughs> and I think seven of them are directed directly to, towards Emma. Why didn't God say if Joseph takes wives without Emma's consent, he'll be destroyed? Where's that? Where's <laughs> that destruction? Yeah. No, he'll be forgiven for his trespasses. That's yeah, right. yeah. That, <laughs> he gets forgiveness that he gets to yeah. the 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 power to do himself. Yeah. 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 Where's like where's if if Joseph takes on Fanny Alger, has sex with her in a barn before the ceiling powers ever even given as my prophet, he'll be destroyed. 
No, nope, he'll be but... forgiven and given all the power. That's what it will. And Emma has to accept her. <laughs> yes. And if Joseph takes on 22 wives before telling Emma. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. And then, again, I, I don't mean to belabor this point, but, like, this language about, like, the, this is women just, geez, Mormon Jesus doesn't care about women. <laughs> because the women are given... And they're only there to make babies and to multiply and replenish the earth. And only the male babies count. <laughs> and then it's only the souls of men that they're burying, not the souls of men and women. And then again, we're believing that God has God is married and has multiple celestial godwives, wow. but it's the work of the father, not work of the father and his oh. wives, right? Right. And the glory goes to who? That he may be glorified, meaning yeah. God. And none of the wives get, none of yeah. the God wives get yeah. any glory. Yeah. Nope. Nope. And you can't talk to them. <laughs> or, or know their name or talk <laughs> about them. Don't send them a text message. <laughs> and this is Jesus. Okay. 64. Well, hey, guys, women, everyone, non-binary people, three more verses to go. Three more verses to go. We're almost done. Verse 64. And again, verily, verily, I say unto you, if any man have a wife who holds the keys of this power, and he teaches unto her the law of my priesthood as pertaining to these things. Then shall she believe and administer unto him, or she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord your God. For I will destroy her, for I will magnify my name upon all those who receive and abide in my law. So who, which women are being destroyed now in this verse? <laughs> the <laughs> ones that won't hand over a woman to their husband, because that's what she has to do. She has to administer to him. So she she's the one that's uh, going to put the woman's hand in their husband's, evidently. Is, is this saying that if a Mormon man tells his existing first wife about the law of eternal marriage, and then she's not down with it. Is this now meaning that, yeah. that, that she that gets destroyed? Yeah. She gets destroyed? Yeah. Yep. So it's not just Emma that's getting destroyed. Any first wife, yep. any Mormon first wife who learns about eternal marriage and refuses, this is like the law of Sarah. So somehow, okay, wait a minute. I know. No, this is big. This is I contradicting just, the law of Sarah. So the law of Sarah says that you, you can't take extra wives unless the fir first wife says yes. Consents. Yeah. But then it's saying in 64 that if the first wife doesn't consent, what? She she can gets it can do it anyway. No, she'll, and get she'll be destroyed, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> that is so weird. Like, why bother giving the law of Sarah? Is that a is that consent if it's the penalty Ag of non-consent is death yeah agency now you're jumping ahead because that's the next verse okay. yeah that's true <laughs> okay sorry but i mean that's to me that's in 64 but i guess as he has mormon to reiterate jesus, it you know at least seven you know seven times as mormon times. jesus does he likes to repeat himself and make things really clear so if mormon jesus didn't make that that destruction of non-consent really clear in verse 64 verse 65 says therefore it shall be lawful in me if she receive not this law, she meaning any other Mormon wife from here to eternity, for him to receive all things whatsoever I, the Lord his God, will give unto him, because she did not believe and administer unto him according to my word, and she then becomes the tra she becomes the transgressor, and he is exempt from the law of Sarah, who administered unto Abraham according to the law when I commanded Abraham to take Hagar, the slave, uh, to wife. Sandra, what's that saying? <laughs> well, the, yeah, the, where do I start? <laughs> um, yeah. Again, the woman has to give her consent. Um, she has or she said she is in transgression. So the woman <laughs> has no power in this arrangement. She has to give consent or she'll be destroyed. And she becomes the one in transgression, not the guy that's got 22 wives already when he brings it up to her. Uh, and, again, and, and this is, this is yeah. again, flying against what the Mormon church is telling women now, which yeah. is that no Mormon woman today yeah. will be forced to practice polygamy. Yet in the scriptures, DNC 132, 60, 
5, it's explicitly canonized as saying, if the woman isn't down with it, she'll be destroyed, yeah. right? And he, yeah. Right. yeah, he is exempt from the law of Sarah. And then he can just do it anyway. Yeah, so and basically, be basically the law of Sarah is BS. And yeah. it's right there in the same section, right? Yeah. Yeah. That same section invalidates itself, right? Yeah. yeah. And you yeah. can't say that this part is just about Emma, it's being generalized to all well, for, that's the women. That's the whole point. Yeah. The whole point is to generalize this, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Kay Holbrook won't talk about this <laughs> verses. She's kept through them. It's weird how they stopped at verse 41. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hank Smith won't talk about it. I mean, he probably loves his verses. <laughs> but he won't talk about them. Yeah. Were, you, were you gonna say something, Sandra? No, that's fine. <laughs> okay. This is just amazing. This is just unbelievable. All right. So so we've come to the final verse of DC 132, <laughs> um, verse 66. Uh, and now, <laughs> as pertaining to this law, verily, verily I say unto you, I will reveal more unto you hereafter. Therefore, let this suffice for the present. <laughs> Behold, I am Alpha and Omega. Amen. What more would he be revealing? <laughs> wow. What's next? Yeah. And where is that revelation, by the way? Well, Kate Holbrook yeah. did talk about this last verse because she was saying, well, maybe he revealed more to Joseph, and that's why he was able to do stuff that didn't align with this revelation. And Yeah, you know. that's why, yes, I guess maybe the further revelation is when... Uh, they had to give up polygamy for exactly. uh, the government. And uh, so is that the next revelation? Mm, is uh, yeah. Oh, by the way, you don't really have to do <laughs> never, it now. Never mind. That's the, <laughs> the, next, never mind. the next convenient revelation. <laughs> like, well, what's the chance that when Mormon Jesus was telling Joseph Smith, there will be more information I give you later. What he meant was, I'm going to roll this whole <laughs> shit show back and take it all away. What's the chance that was what Mormon <laughs> Jesus was thinking when he said verse 66? What do you think, yeah. Jen? What's the likelihood uh -huh. that that's what Mormon yeah. Jesus? I usually don't swear. But they always I, they they always <laughs> have to give him an out. They they the brethren always give themselves an out. So he had to make sure he had a little out there at the at the end. Yeah. Just have to throw that in there. But maybe Joseph really had some other crazy ideas I know, I know. that were worse than this. <laughs> and and he didn't have time that day to deal with anymore. Can you see Emma? <laughs> oh, wait, there's more? <laughs> there's more? What, what, what more could there possibly be? Isn't there Joseph? a story that she ripped this up and threw it in the fire? <laughs> yeah. Isn't yeah. there a story? Okay, I believe that. I believe that story. <laughs> <laughs> There's more. <laughs> oh my goodness! That I'm poor girl. I'm surprised no Hiram they... left alive. I'm surprised. No wonder she went like with the other church and said that never happened. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like seriously, <laughs> poor girl. Like seriously, big hugs to you in heaven, Emma. You like you're my hero. Mm. Uh... Well, we, we, we made it, it through. <laughs> we did it in only two hours. We All broke right. a, we broke a land speed, a Mormon stories land speed record. <laughs> we did it. Oh dear. I, I mm. called this, this last episode, the truth about Joseph Smith's polygamy. You got a little clickbait in your, in your <laughs> thumbnail. We're, <laughs> we're reading the scriptures, man. Like he <laughs> doesn't get more truth than that. It's right. Fine. I have a testimony. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Yeah. 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 Well, th th there you have it, brethren and sister and, and everyone else. Uh, yes. That's DNC 132. I actually, I actually summarized. Uh, okay. I want each of you to think about summarizing what's wrong with DNC 132, but I made a short mm -hmm. list and you guys can add to it. So just to summarize, Mormon Jesus in DNC 132 treats women as cattle. They're given to men. They're literally called property. Right, um, they're tr they're 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 counted as a fraction of the worth of men, right? Um, they're threatened with destruction. There's no consent. There's no agency. They're threatened with destruction, and that's peaceful Prince of Peace Mormon Jesus threatening women with destruction, including Emma, if they do not obey. But then also pretending like they get choice in the matter, which is almost gaslighting in, in and of itself. 
there's the question of the likelihood that this is really God versus Joseph just trying to justify bad action. There's, um, you know, there's the fact that, 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 that this is not just for Joseph and Emma, but it's for the church, but God is giving such specific detailed information about Joseph and Emma's situation as scripture. And then there's just the question that LDS discussions and other, you know, it's, it's 1840, whatever. What are some of the things God could be giving revelation about? Oh, oh I don't know. Slavery, the civil war that's about to come. Boiling germ, water. Germ theory. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that God could, could conveniently be giving revelations about. It's going to be threatening and coercing women to let men have lots of sexual partners, right? And, oh, by the way, none of this matters now in 2022. It's all a big never mind, um, you know, and, and the fact that all of this is hid from investigators and from Mormons and it's not discussed and it's, it's basically passed over every single year. Okay. That's my, that's my summary of problems. Do you want to add anything, Sandra? Amen. <laughs> okay. And yeah, I, I would imagine you would say what this makes Jesus look like, right? Well, yes. And how this betrays New Testament Jesus, no? Right. It's, it is not the picture of Jesus that anyone encounters when they read the Gospels. Uh, it makes Jesus, Jesus like is what? known yeah. for his acceptance and love, forgiveness, and encouragement of people, helping the downtrodden, uh, championing the down and out, trying to break through barriers like the Good Samaritan story. Um, and that this doesn't sound like the Good Samaritan story. It sounds like a different person. Not yeah. to mention Jesus said there'll be no marriage in heaven. That's right. <laughs> right? Okay, Gerardo, you want to add to the list or did we cover them all? I think you covered it, mo most of that. Yeah, I think all of that, all that I can think of. Jen? Um, Bring it I home. <laughs> <laughs> Bring us home, Jen. I would just say that they basically strip every woman or heavenly mother of identity. Um, and doing that also strips her um, from communicating with her children. Um, and as a mother, I could think of no other greater hell than being divided from my kids. And so um, I think that, like, st stripping identity and humanity and everything from a woman is is heinous <laughs> is is the worst kind of man yeah and yet this is supposed to be jesus or god uh, doing yeah. all this yeah this isn't my god right. yeah and and again heavenly mother heavenly mothers they're nameless here the, their glory and their power yeah. is irrelevant here and it doesn't even it doesn't even matter if you believe in this religion or not just even to stand for a religion that that teaches that to women is just not okay. Yeah. It's just not okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can't get mad at Warren Jeffs or the FLDS Church or the United Apostolic Brethren. You can't get mad at any uh, modern Mormon fundamentalist cult. I mean... The, the Under the Banner of Heaven series is about to come out. They're going to be talking about the Lafferty brothers. They're going to be talking about all the different fundamentalist offshoots, yeah. including Warren Jeffs. They're all just, they're just obeying DNC 132. Am I wrong? That's, that's no, they it. are. They are all following the prophet. Yeah. Yeah. This is our ancestors. Uh, Warren Jeffs today is the same as what our ancestors obeyed and went through yeah. Uh, in Nauvoo and in Utah. Yeah. 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 So check out Carolyn Pearson's The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy, uh, the book and um, the previous episodes. Check out our previous episodes if you haven't listened to them. And uh, yeah, Sandra, thank you so much okay. for being willing to come here <laughs> yeah. and uh, share your wit and wisdom. Our <laughs> audience loves you. They adore you. We've gotten hundreds of comments about how much people love and appreciate you. You really are a legend yeah. and a hero to so, so many. Thanks for being willing to well, come on. Thank you. <laughs> what do we have to do to get you back to talk about other things? Uh, I guess uh, 
uh, it all depends on how controversial it is. <laughs> <laughs> There'll <right>. be more. <laughs> okay. Well, well, I would just say on behalf of my audience, if, if you're willing to come back, we'll, we'll even do our best to kind of make it worth your while financially. Cause we respect your expertise. We would love to have you back to, to talk about other big issues. Cause yeah. you, you've got 500 of these things you can talk about, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> How uh, can people support someone's just wrote Sandra Tanner's a national treasure. I agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sandra, how can people support you and you personally, but also your, your life's work? Uh, well, if they want to make a donation to the ministry, they can send uh, money. If, if anyone does stuff through the mail anymore, to our P.O. Box at 1884 Salt Lake City, Utah. We'll include that in the show notes. And um, so, and if they're in Salt Lake, they can stop by the bookstore and say, hi, I have people stop in almost every day that want to have their picture taken with me. Uh, I think our, you should charge them to take yeah. a picture with you. <laughs> My mailroom guy is becoming a professional photographer because he always has to come out from the back and come <laughs> take the pictures for us. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, stop by and say hello. <laughs> and also you sell books, right? Oh, well, yes. By the way, we have a little bookstore and we have a lot of the books dealing with these different subjects there in the store. And Plus the, a lot of free papers. And the website is? The website is what? UTLM. UTLM.org. Ut oh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> these hard questions at the end. They're just, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, Sandra, thank you so much. And Gerardo, you're a freaking treasure too. Thank you so much yeah. for being a part of this and helping this happen. Thank you. Yeah. We've got good stuff coming up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. exciting stuff. We've got more Simon Southerton. We've got more John Larson, hopefully. We've got uh, LDS discussions. Lots of cool things on the right. Maven. We might even be interviewing Maven sometime soon. Yeah. One of the founders of Fair Mormon soon oh yeah 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 <laughs> carry shirts right yeah 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 well, anyway I mean, so many good mormon stories episodes Mar margie is going to keep doing her thrive stories like love margie yeah so much good in the weeks months and years ahead so gerardo thank you so much for everything you do for the osf yeah and jen you are a freaking bright light and a breath of fresh air and you're amazing <laughs> oh i thank you appreciate that <laughs> and i've been getting like I, I, every time i get when i send it to you but i've been getting dozens and dozens <laughs> and dozens of comments and emails saying how much people love you so mm -hmm. thanks everybody i yeah. love you too <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks uh thanks for the support just really quickly thanks to everyone who uh donated through super chat whenever you do these live streams on youtube you can donate through the super chat feature uh, that helps us uh, stay alive. Um, that helps us make all this possible. Through the Facebook feature, you can also click on the stars and donate through that. And then, of course, the preferred way is for you just to become a monthly donor at mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button, become a monthly donor, and uh, whatever you can afford. We that All that money is tax deductible. We're transparent in our finances, and 100% of what you give to us goes to Jen and Gerardo and Sandra and me and these facilities and other people behind the scenes like Jennifer and Brooklyn and others. There's this whole operation here that makes all this possible. And, um, John Larson and Simon and, you know, so, so please do support us if you value what, uh, we do. And as long as you do, we'll keep doing what we do. Um, and we'll just keep fulfilling the mission of the open stories foundation, which is to provide informed consent to Mormons and Mormon investigators throughout the world to provide support for Mormons in faith crisis, and to promote healing and growth and community for people who leave Mormonism and need support elsewhere. That's what the Open Stories Foundation is about, and that's why we need your support. And finally, be a menace. Be a menace. Support Black Menaces. Buy their shirts. Buy their swag. Support them. Check them out. Follow them on TikTok and on Instagram. Support them. Email them. Love them. And uh, we just give our, our healthy, hearty, supportive shout out to black menaces and the, and the great work that y'all doing and to Utah lighthouse ministry oh. and to Sandra Tanner. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We'll see you next week. All right, Sandra. Uh, I, I think I'm busy next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Two weeks. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Probably not two weeks. <laughs> no. Okay. Too, All right. Too soon. <laughs> too soon. All right. Well, we are going to be sharing. I just found out from Chris Thomas. He gave me the go ahead. 
Yes. Next episode, I think we're going to stream it tomorrow. We're going to be sharing a story of our friend, Chris Thomas, interviewing you yeah. about your journey with the Book of Mormon. Right. Yes. Way back in the dark ages when we had to struggle with that after losing our faith in all the rest of Mormonism, hanging it on to the Book of Mormon for three more years and what that looked like. <laughs> so listeners and viewers, check out tomorrow or in the next sequential episode of Mormon Stories, a really special episode of our friend Chris Thomas interviewing you, Sandra, about the yeah. Book of Mormon. Okay. All right. So a month, a month, uh, maybe. <laughs> okay. We got it. We just heard that. Maybe. We're gonna hold it. All right. Thanks everyone. Uh, sleep well, be kind to each other, be good to each other, have compassion for each other. And we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon stories podcast. Bye everybody.